The search for shelter and warmth is one of the basic instincts of mankind. We find what shelter we can in a builder's box, a small house, or stacked up pile of flats, making the best of what we can find or afford. And then, like a nesting bird in a hole in a tree, we set about making our box livable. Bertrand Russell once said, if the social ideals of an age are to be judged by the aesthetic quality of its architecture, the last hundred years represent the lowest point yet reached by humanity. If man is partly a product of his surroundings, then by improving the environment, you improve the individual and thus the society. This equation lies behind much of 20th century architecture and town planning. In a land as rich in paradox as India, it is no surprise to find that one of the country's most interesting architect is an Englishman. Though after close and 40 years of pioneering work in different parts of India, Laurie Baker can hardly be called a foreigner. born and brought up in the West and educated there. How did you adopt to our uh, Indian tropical conditions? I mean, your designs, how did you adopt? Well, um, actually it was, I was forced to adopt because I came back to India um, doing work for leprosy patients, uh, an organization that had a lot of homes, leprosy homes all over India. And during the war, we had discovered new drugs which made it possible to treat leprosy. So my job was to convert old buildings that had been mere asylums and homes into modern hospitals where people could come and get treatment and go back home again. But funds were limited. So <laughs> I came out as a British architect having been trained in England and done some work in England before I came out to the East. And I found that many of the materials that I was supposed to deal with, I'd never heard of. Laterite, for instance, yeah. the stone we have here, I'd never heard of such a thing. And then all this mud and thatch and bamboo, they were entirely alien to me in, <laughs> uh, in what I had been trained uh, in school, in the School of Architecture. And I found that engineers and architects were no help. They didn't help me at all over these problems. So I found the answer in the indigenous buildings. Wherever you went, there were these uh, buildings of mud and thatch, and I would find out how they built them, what were the special tricks of the trade. And then I tried to adapt my English teaching and my English upbringing, which of course was more or less universal, the principles of construction, as you know, apply anywhere. So, <laughs> but I had to go from the bottom end in India, as it were, and uh, come upwards rather than try and impose what I had learned. So I know that you are a Gandhian. So how far you are able to convey this Gandhian philosophy to your profession? Well, I. I would uh, qualify this <laughs> uh, statement of yours that you know I'm a Gandhian. I met Gandhi several times while I was waiting for this boat to go back to England. And it's because of him I came back. Uh, it was at the height of the Quit India movement. And of course, it's quite wrong to tell Laurie Baker not to do a thing because he immediately does it. So, <laughs> so I came back here uh, very much believing in all that he was doing and all that he was saying. And I think his general principles 
in whatever line still apply very much to all of us anywhere and particularly here in India. So as he pointed out to me almost in the first time I met him, you are bringing knowledge and qualifications from the West, but they will be useless if, unless you try and understand our needs here. And the greatest needs are in the villages and uh, make, uh, for the ordinary people, not places like this, Bombay or wherever. Whether it is a small town or a village or a big city, in our country a common sight is the all too commonplace concrete structure. The advanced building material, concrete, has given rise to these structures which has a genealogy inherent in the process of modernization. Regarding the housing problem, I know it's a big question to be asked. How do you see the housing problem in India? I mean, for example, the statistics. Well, of course, statistics are always very frightening unless they're used to show that we needn't get upset about things. Um, we hear, for example, that there are anything between 20 and 30 million families in the country without anything at all in the way of shelter. Now, I see the big problem uh, as being we are trying to tackle it with our PWD and modern methods of reinforced concrete very much to the fore. And at the same time, we have only a very limited amount of money to do each house. It is supposed to be something like 6,000 rupees. Now, we all know what you can do with 6,000 rupees in the reinforced concrete line. You could just put one slab in a kitchen and you've finished. So we have to think in terms of indigenous methods of um, uh, building and local materials and then we must upgrade them and use our 20th century know-how to use them intelligently and acceptably so that we can actually build for 6,000 rupees a small house for a family who has nothing. So I think we as architects, if we want to help in this problem of supplying the missing housing to the country, we've got to start thinking small. Yeah. And I'm very concerned that we don't really show any signs of developing an Indian style of modern architecture. If you took a modern building from where Peru and the, uh, Germany and England and uh, China yeah. and uh, South America um, and an Indian one, put them in a desert, would you be able to pick out which was the Indian one, which was the Peruvian one? I don't think we would. They all look the same, which I think is a pity because our ways of living are very different from those of the people in Peru or China or wherever else it is. And the building should reflect our ways of living, our culture, what we want. Kerala has a distinctive architectural style, both in its religious and domestic traditions. Peculiarly suited to its given climatic conditions and dictated by the available materials of wood and coconut palm leaves, it was perfectly attuned to the ways of life and habits of a society. But now, it is inevitable that the landscape in all its environmental aspects has changed. The living habitat also has to make constant readjustments with the present. The functionalism and rationality implicit in this international architectural style when transplanted into our own context is at variance with our living environment, habits and ethos, thus bringing in a style that is drab, deadpan and impersonal. Every district you go to is a different style of indigenous local architecture. In that style shows how you can use the local materials, the materials right there on the ground and growing around the site where you're going to build, uh, how you can cope with the local climate, the special winds, the special rainfall, the uh, topography, whether it's rocky or sandy or marshy or whatever it is, 
All these things are reflected in the indigenous, indigenous architecture, but not in our modern stuff. Exactly the same thing is put in a, de in a desert as it is yeah. <laughs> in a marsh or in a forest or in a city or in the country. It's all the same and totally unsuitable. As far as the people are concerned, uh, the people who have nothing just want something. And they must have a roof, they must have water, they must have sanitation, they must have a s something like a smokeless chula or some way of cooking and using fuel for cooking. These are their basic problems, and we as engineers and architects are not applying ourselves, as we should do, <laughs> to these problems. This is the hostel for the Centre for Development Studies. Uh, there are all sorts of people living behind it. Sometimes they're not here, so we wanted the... This is a veranda, three verandas, one on top of the other, and uh, they need it closed in for the periods when it's not in use. What is this? Why this wall is... Uh, well, thin? you see, actually, this is just a four and a half inch wall. It's three stories high, and it is load-bearing, carrying the weight of the floor. You see, if you've got a wall like that, you can either knock it over, or you can crush it, yes. so it's all crushed. But as soon as you do that, yeah. then neither can you knock it over, nor can you crush it. So this is just the simple uh, packing paper <laughs> principle. And because it goes in and out, it can carry the whole weight. Then, of course, these are instead of windows. Uh -huh. This doesn't cost anything. In fact, it costs less because there are all these bricks missing. Yeah. And you get very good lighting, as we'll see when we go inside. Yeah. This is a very interesting corner here. This is so that you don't have to cut, cut bricks. Every time you cut a brick means money. It's yes. uh, only a little bit, but when there are a thousand of these cuts. Yes. Also, of course, this is a strong surface. It doesn't let in the water, whereas a cut brick would yes. absorb a certain yes. amount of water. This is about 15 years old. Uh, people are always worried that um, it will absorb yes. moisture and it will grow moss and lichen and all this sort of thing, fungus. But you can see it doesn't simply because there's a good big overhang. Yeah. All our traditional roofs protect the walls as well as the whole house. And it's only when uh, buildings are exposed to um, pouring rain and moss that they grow the moss. This one you can see is perfectly dry. This hasn't been cleaned or whitewashed or anything like that. And yet it's 15 years old and looks as good as new. Now, you see, you've got all the light you need from that. Yeah. It's carrying the weight of the roof. It's a lighter roof than the ordinary roof. But uh, no problems at all. No water comes in. And uh, you've got this. Then you see this, the same with the staircase. Yeah. Um, you save a lot of room by yeah. using a circular Fire staircase. Room. And actually, and hollow column, I mean. that's hollow yeah. uh, again. It's this principle that you can is very, very strong when it's a hollow like that. There's no need for a solid one. If you've got a small solid column of reinforced concrete, then these steps will go to a narrow point. But here I can walk up and down quite easily, you see. So most people, they talk about the durability, the lifespan of these buildings. So yes. you mean to say that they're fully stable? Yes. Um, this is a problem that is always coming up. I mean, the problem is people doubting. Uh, a long time ago, uh, when I was brought up, of course, we just had this rule of thumb, how thick a wall should be, how thick a slab should be, how high, all this sort of thing. Now there is no excuse at all for any building being um, uh, unstable or, as we say, uh, it won't last, because we can calculate. We know the compressive strength of the brick. We know the compressive strength of mortar. We know the weight of the room above. We know the thrust up. So